Um, I, so I wanted to ask what your childhood was like, just your surroundings and, and like that, like how your youth was. Well, I had, a, I think, a nice childhood. We were in very modest means, and poverty-stricken during the uh, times, I guess you'd say, that were the Depression times, but uh, family still was happy. We got along. Of course, I know my father and mother worried a lot, but uh, we weren't much aware of that. And we had a, a rural life then, and at se age seven we moved to Inglewood where he set up a, an animal hospital for mostly dogs and cats and so forth. Uh, but he still did large animal work. Uh, he did, uh, oh, he worked on all the lions and the other wild animals that were kept at Goebbels uh, Lion Farm where they kept the animals for the Tarzan movies and such things as that. And uh, so I grew up and went to high school in Inglewood, and I think had a very happy life. I enjoyed the place where we lived, the country. I thought it was beautiful at that time. Not so much now, by a long shot. But then uh, I went to UCLA. I graduated from high school in 1934 and went to UCLA and just went the usual four years and majored in, in I majored in English and uh, got out. I don't know if that's enough about childhood. Uh, I was always interested in the wilderness, the outdoors, the frontier, such as we wished it could be. And uh, so we had a, a pleasant family life. Not without its problems, but we did have it. Um, did you did you make the rounds with your dad and stuff like that? Yeah, from the days I was very small, I used to go out with him once in a while, and I remembered, but because I grew up in a Japanese American community at that time, it was Japanese farmers, and they were first generation and they couldn't speak English, or at least not much. And the kids I went to school with were Nisei, the second generation Japanese. And they were a little more American, but uh, after school every day, I remember when we were in the early grades up to about the third grade, those kids had to go to Japanese school after they went to the regular school. And uh, so we didn't see much of them after school. But uh, it was a Japanese community, really. I, when I was a little kid, I didn't know that kites were shaped like that. I always thought they were they were all birds and dragons and things, you know. And uh, uh, my father would go out to a farm, a typical Japanese truck farm or truck garden or whatever you want to call it, and uh, they lived in rather simple, unpainted houses for the most part, up on stilts usually, and uh, uh, he would... Uh, go to the barn or wherever the mule or the cow or the goat was that wasn't doing so well that the farmer had mentioned to him when he'd run across him in town uh, sometime during the preceding week or so. And he would find the animal and treat it, do what he had to do with it, even operate on it if necessary. And the family, the farmers, would, wouldn't even come in from the fields. They were still out working in the fields in their truck farm. and. Uh, Oh, a week or two later, he'd happen to run across the man in the in the bank, and the, the farmer would just peel off the money and pay him. And that's the kind of life they lived then. It wasn't a, a billing situation or anything like that. And uh, then we moved to, uh, I remember our school project, one of the projects we had in uh, the grammar school I went to, was raising silkworms and making silk thread, taking it off the cocoons and, and spinning it, you know, and all that. And uh, I always wondered, how can they ever get enough of this stuff to make any cloth out of it? You know, they must, must use billions of silkworms because our little cages full of silkworms wouldn't produce very much. Then we moved to Inglewood, where he built the dog and cat hospital after a lot of economic hardship. 
uh, in the, around 1930. And uh, he actually asked me, as a 12-year-old or so, to design the building. I took great pride in drawings, and uh, they built it to the make it look like the thing I had done. I was quite proud of that. And uh, it eventually burned down. But uh, I remember that uh, he still worked on large animals. And uh, at one point, the uh, circus was in town, Barnum and Bailey. And uh, they had something wrong with one of the elephants. And they uh, marched this elephant over to the dog and cat hospital and uh, made it raise its foot while my father went out in front and uh, worked on it. So some of the memories that I have. That's still running? Yeah, it is. Is it alright for me to butt in like that? Yeah. No, it's fine. Um, I don't know what to say here anyway. Well, so the depression didn't didn't uh, affect you so much then? Well, it affect every, affected everybody pretty equally and people just didn't expect too much out of life then. They, uh, they got along well with each other. It was, Crime was virtually unknown. People never locked their houses. You couldn't lock your car. You usually just had a switch, not, not an ignition key, you know. And uh, if you locked your house, the Iceman couldn't get in when he came around, you know. So uh, it was a different kind of world, period of honesty and trust people had for one another. And you and you finished college then. Is that yeah? What were you, what were your goals? Did you have lifetime goals at that time? I that? didn't really know. Uh, I I did a lot of uh, drawing and sketching and so forth. And vaguely in my head, I thought something might come of that. But it was really so much work. I didn't uh, I didn't want to spend my life at it, uh, at being an artist. And uh, I I didn't know. I was just going with the tide. He went to college for four years to graduate because there wasn't much else to do, and uh, it was a good time. It was a nice time. I got involved in the extracurricular activities and so forth, and uh, and made it through. It wasn't uh, as easy as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> they had fairly high standards, and then you had to take a comprehensive examination at the end of the four years, and. That meant you had to remember everything you were supposed to have learned, and a lot of it I had, I'm afraid I just bluffed my way through the tests. And then when the chips were down and I had to remember four years' worth, that was wrong. And I had to take the test twice, six hour examination. Uh, and then uh, when I got out, I just applied for the first job that uh, came along at the School Employment Bureau. and. World War II was already starting, and I think we knew in the back of our heads that we were going to be in it, although, you know, there hadn't been Pearl Harbor or anything like that. So, in a sense, we were mark just marking time, the, my generation, or people of my age, and, uh, oh, it was, let's say, 39, the year of 39, I, I was uh, hired for my first job. And I just took it and went there. You didn't turn down jobs in those days. You took what you could get. But this one was kind of nice. It was $75 a month and room and board. And it was to be the first publicity man that the wigwam ever had. And you know the place up in Litchfield Park? The, no, I don't. The guest ranch is the best dude ranch in the world. The wigwam. It was a dude ranch. Well, uh, it belongs to... Uh, Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. It was previously just for their executives, but they opened it to the public, and then they wanted a publicity man who would give it the right image. Well, here I was just a kid. I was 22 years old, and uh, but I could uh, I could use a camera, and what they mainly wanted was to uh, uh, have photographs of their guests sent to the hometown newspapers in Wisconsin or Ohio, wherever it might be, sitting on a horse or playing croquet or at a cookout or something, you know, having a nice time. Uh, it would go in the society pages. 
and that was what I did. I would take pictures of the guests and, and get, put a little squib with it and send it to the hometown paper. And that was it. Time out. we got to make a one quick adjustment. A little bit left the center. That's I, okay. That's, that's what you want. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we're rolling again. Now, in other words, what the thing is... Oh, uh, yeah, that sound. So your first job was in the tourist, was in the, I better get you to just, um, I'm sorry, let's, let's do whatever. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that's interesting because somehow it seems like the canyon's all tied up in that stuff too. Who? Right. Oh, the canyon. But I, but I think we're getting ahead of ourselves there. So I just wanted to get back to your first job was in the tourist business. It was, in a way, except that those people who were guests at the wigwam had come there usually to spend weeks or months. They'd, they'd stay a long time. Well, a few came for a weekend, I guess, or a week, but it was a place where people came to get away from the cold winters, and they generally were pretty well fixed with money and all this. And they, uh, as I recall, they tended to be older people. But they like to play golf and do all the things that we do there. It was a beautiful spot. It's still quite impressive, but it's gotten into the big time now. It's a, a, an expensive place, I'm sure, to stay. Um, what, when did you do your first river trip? My first river trip of any kind on whitewater? You, yeah. You mean, uh, I can't remember, you know, there might be some little things like on the Russian River or something like that. I did, in canoes, you know, we're talking about little riffles and so forth. But a river trip that would amount to something would have been in, uh, I guess, 1952 in Dinosaur, both the Yampa and Lodore, and then on down uh, on the combined rivers, the Green, through... Uh, Whirlpool Canyon and, uh, you know, Rainbow Park, Island Park, and Split Mountain. And uh, I did that with my wife and kids. And I think my daughter was only two years old at the time. But it wasn't a used place then, you know. It was almost unheard of. What inspired you to go? Uh, Dinosaur National Monument had become a, a cause. They were going to put dams in it, two of them. Uh, Echo Park Dam and Split Mountain Dam, which would have ruined the whole place, of course. And uh, I got involved in the issue before I'd ever seen the place. Uh, a man named Deborah Butcher was the editor of the National Parks magazine at that time. And he, he set the country on fire about dinosaur. He really started it. His son, uh, Russ Butcher, works for the National Parks Association now. But uh, uh, then finally the Sierra Club took it up as a major cause to stop those dams. And one of the ways that was thought of was to popularize river floating, which would no longer be possible if uh, the dam, either one of them, were built. And uh, I went in before that, so I went in, I think, 52, and explored around, took pictures, and brought them back and published them in the various conservation publications. And uh, uh, the Sierra Club took hold of it, and Dave Brower was very strong in that campaign. He had just become the executive director of the Sierra Club. It was a new job to him, and it was a new job for the club, too. And uh, this was one of his first major issues, or campaigns. And uh, so we were in it together, so to speak, and the whole club joined together on it and even had major outings there. In 1953, the club went there with lots of people. And uh, Bus Hatch, the uh, father of Don and Ted Hatch, uh, had his big pontoons and they were oar driven, you know, they'd have two, two oarsmen. And uh, they ran Echo Park down, Split Mountain and all that. And there was quite a quite a to-do, and the local papers, they didn't know which way to go, whether this new burst of tourism on these unheard-of rivers was going to 
mean a great deal in Vernal, or whether it was just these Californians who were coming to take their river back away from them <laughs> and spoil all their plans, you know. So it became a, a Utah issue with their, their senators and their whole congressional delegation and uh, the Secretary of the Interior and the President, Eisenhower. Those dams are going to be built, he said. And we said, the hell they are. And we kept at it and kept at it. It was the Sierra Club's first big fight and certainly the only one up to that time in post-war times, although the Sierra Club had been involved in the creation of Kings Canyon National Park before that. But this was the first really big political fight the Sierra Club and other organizations got into and won. Where's Beat it? the dammers at their own The game. Dinosaur. Dinosaur National Monument. Did, okay, let's back up a little bit. Um, that's okay, Bronco. That was my first river trip anyway. Uh, do you remember Hoover Dam being built? Yes. What did you What did you think of that? At that time, there was there was no consciousness about um, the river. I mean, on anybody's part, it wasn't it wasn't considered. It wasn't even thought of as having much to do with the Grand Canyon. The fact later came out that you could take a cruise up into the Grand Canyon overnight on a big, big launch, you know, before the lower canyon silted in. Uh, they take visitors all the way from uh, Boulder Beach, way down near Boulder City, and on up to uh, Columbine Falls, and they would go in there, and, uh, and then right on up the river, right up, up among the cliffs, typical Grand Canyon scenery. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was considered nice. But when, when Hoover Dam was being built, it was such a monstrous uh, project. And you couldn't help but, I think everybody kind of felt pride in it, but we didn't know any better. And not that it's necessarily all bad. I suppose uh, for its time, it could not be seen as anything but good because it was going to control the Colorado which had been totally out of control until it was built. It made it possible to farm the Imperial Valley and the other places down that way without constant threat of, of floods and other things. And then incidentally came the power, which uh, was what was supposed to pay for it. So I didn't, uh, I was young then too. It was finished in 38. Well, that's about when I got out of school, but it ran off like water off a duck's back as far as the environmental issue that might have been involved is concerned. Uh, I never connected it with uh, the Grand Canyon. In fact, I had never seen the Grand Canyon at that time. Did, did you think of yourself as an environmentalist then? No, the word hadn't been invented. <laughs> no, I didn't. I think, I thought, Everybody ought to care about how beautiful the world is. And as far as I knew, everybody did. Um, I thought, well, you know, it never occurred to me to do anything except what you're impelled to do, feel, and express. Um, I didn't like a lot of roads on the map. I wanted some empty space. I wanted a frontier, you know, not just for adventure, but because that part of the world would be unmarked, wherever it might be, especially in California. When you look at a road, of, I mean at a map of the Mojave Desert and see these roads all crisscrossing all over it, to me that was terrible. And the idea that they'd be crossing the Sierra and chopping up the longest of all our wildernesses was, uh, was an anathema to me. And in fact, in UCLA, several of us formed an organization called California Trails, and it was uh, set up for the sole reason, the sole reason for its existence was to stop the Lone Pine to Porterville Highway they were going to build south of Mount Whitney and south of Sequoia National Park, right across the Sierra. They also had plans to build one over Kearsarge Pass, I don't know if you know all these places, but what is now the John Muir Trail would have been chopped up by these Trans Mountain Highways. 
which wouldn't have been of any use at all in the winter because they would be much higher than Tioga Pass. And uh, so we thought, you know, that was just the last straw. That was a way beyond anything we would put up with. So we started a club. And uh, others got somewhat interested too, but I think the feeling then was that you can't stop progress. Progress is good, it's coming no matter what we do. If we don't like it, there's something wrong with us. You can't stop it. This is the way the world is going to be. And uh, we deplored that. A lot of us did. And so, at least a few of us did. But anyway, we charged a dollar for a membership and the dollars came in. And. Uh, and we wrote and we were published or publicized in certain magazines and all that and more of them.